Welcome back to Thimbleberry U. I am John Jagge, joined again by Amy Walls from Thimbleberry Financial. Great to be back with you. Jag, I love being here. So, Amy, as a financial advisor, you want people to save more money, obviously. And I feel like expenses and spending is such a wild card for so many people and varies all over the place. Tell me about how you talk to clients about reducing their spending. Well, I definitely talk with clients about spending money and how to reduce, but it's probably not as common as some might think. Okay. Spending happens for everybody. So that's why I'm talking about it with clients, whether they're in healthcare or tech or some other industry. And the reason that we're going to focus on this is it's the number one financial item that people have control over. Yes. Okay. Okay. Number one financial item they have control over. Now, oftentimes people may not recognize they have control over it and they feel more like the expenses control them, Mm -hmm. but expenses are a choice. And so maybe you have a house and as a result of the house, you have different utilities, you know, given the size of the house, your yard, the water bills, et cetera. Mm -hmm. Those are the consequences of your choice to buy this house. Okay. And so the house is a choice, right? So that is one reason we talk about it. It's also one of the things that can impact a financial plan and the ability to reach goals more than anything else. And it is because it is the thing that someone has control over. It's interesting you mentioned about the house and having those bills. My initial thought is that you've got your fixed bills, your mortgage, your electric bill, your car bill, your car insurance, all these types of things. But- You're right. It does come back to what you've spent on the house and the house you bought. But in general, your spending is really something that you have the most control over. And I think people just don't realize what they spend. I think that's true. I think it's sometimes that once you've made the decision, it can be a done deal. Mm -hmm. And so um, then it's just not a question in someone's mind anymore. Right. You want a different out, if you will. Okay. But when we're talking about spending, it's not always about reducing spending. Sometimes the conversations are about helping someone let go of guilt by giving them the validation that they can afford to spend something. Really? Or spend on something they want to. That happens a lot. Hmm. Um, Almost as much as we're talking about cutting expenses. Just sort of giving them that grace and that permission to say, yes, you can spend money. Because I think sometimes we get caught up on feeling guilty about spending something that is worthwhile to our happiness and within our budget. And they say, oh, you know, I I really don't. I mean, I'll give you an example. So my wife's and I, third anniversary is tomorrow. And she said, you know, I'm I'm trying to get in better shape. I want to get one of those Apple watches. I don't have to carry my phone with me when I go for a run. I said, okay, that'll be your anniversary present. I'm going to get you an Apple watch. Oh, you know, it's so expensive. We really have other things we should be saving the money for. We said, no, no, no. We've got some money saved up for this type of thing. This is something you really want. It's for you. It's for your health to get you in better shape and be healthier. It's absolutely something I'll buy for. And I had to talk her into letting me spend the money (laughs) to buy the Apple Watch, which was well within our budget for the month. Mm -hmm. Yeah, guilt is a big issue, right? And guilt and shame are the same thing, Mm -hmm. in a sense. So there's a couple of places where we run into this guilt and needing validation that it's okay to spend money. One example that where I see it is in tech. Maybe it's a 30 year old who works for a company that went public Mm -hmm. and they now received all these stock options. And at 30 years old, they're finding themselves a millionaire (laughs) and they grew up in a very modest, you know, household and they never expected to have money like this. They Mm -hmm. don't feel that they did anything special to have received all of that money. They kind of ended up, they they feel like they were just lucky. It's that imposter syndrome. Yes. Um, So they may have a lot of guilt and just different feelings about that. Mm -hmm. And how then can they talk to their parents about money when this is the situation they found themselves in by chance, if you will. It's their hard work too. Uh, but they don't see that and their parents are in a very different place and that's who they normally would have turned to. So I've seen that create some interesting dynamics. Another place that we might run into this where someone needs to be able to let go of that guilt, no, it's okay, is in healthcare when someone transitions from residency into their career. Okay. All of a the sudden they get this big increase in pay 
you know, maybe they go from residency salary, which is pretty small to $400,000 a year as a radiologist. Yeah. Right. There's some big differences and you have to deal with those emotions in order to know how to save and how to spend. As one of the great poets of our time once said, mo money, mo problems. Absolutely. Notorious B.I.G. for those of you who don't know the reference. (laughs) So sometimes they just need to know that they are already doing the right things. And so it's okay to spend this money. Like I said, I'm not always recommending reductions in spending. Sometimes I'm actually recommending increases in spending. And just sort of giving them that permission and saying it's okay. Yes, it's okay. So an, an example there is a client that was close to retirement, but traveled a lot. Mm -hmm. You know, spent a lot of time in hotel rooms and on the road eating out and hadn't taken great care of himself in the process. Mm -hmm. And all he wanted to do in retirement was to take his wife to all of the amazing places around the world that he had gotten to experience in his career. Okay, all he wanted to do. And she was looking forward to it. And we realized that if he didn't start taking care of himself, he probably wasn't going to get there. Hmm. And so in that case, we actually bumped up they're spending now quite a bit to allow him to get healthy and have the accountability that he needed so that that retirement dream could come true. It's interesting. It's looking at that whole 360 degree picture of somebody's life. Okay. Yep. So Jag, there's um, an Aesop's fable about ants and grasshoppers. And I sometimes talk to clients about this, but usually I only share it with the ants. It doesn't seem like it fits really well with the grasshoppers. Um, <laughs> But, you know, the story goes that the ants collect food for for the winter, Mm -hmm. right? And the grasshoppers come in and eat it all. (laughs) And so while we're talking today about tips and tricks to reduce spending, it depends on who I'm working with. Am I working with an ant or a grasshopper or or a creature is somewhere in between? Mm -hmm. Uh, With the ants, I'm helping them increase their spending so they can live the life they really want to and get comfortable with that. Mm -hmm. But the grasshoppers, then maybe we're needing to reduce some spending and have some accountability there. Got it. Okay. So, Amy, a lot of this is emotional, Amy, and we've talked about spending, but the other side of the coin from spending is saving, right? Yes, absolutely. And there are a few rules of thumb around saving. I'm not a big fan of rules of thumb, but people need a little gauge to say, how am I doing? You know, am I in the ballpark? Mm -hmm. So what I'd say for rules of thumb is that of take home pay from salary. So take home pay from just regular salary. This is your net on your paycheck. Absolutely. Save a minimum of 15%. Okay. Your regular monthly expenses, the mortgage, the utilities, groceries, entertainment, et cetera, are 65%. Okay. No more than that. And then some no guilt spending up to 20%. Okay. I'm a little surprised that it's that high, but that goes back to your point from earlier. Yeah. We need balance and everybody's balance is going to be different, which is the reason I don't love rules of thumb. But if we just need a general gauge, that's, that's good. I'm also happy to have the saving a minimum of 15%. And uh, no guilt spending of 20% reversed. Okay, so you're saying save 20% and spend 15%. Nothing wrong with that. Nothing's wrong with that either. So those could be interchangeable. And especially if someone has kids, 15% of savings, if you've got a retirement goal, you've got some education goals, it's probably not going to get you there. Okay. So that covers the salary and the base salary we talked about. So bonuses, I think there's probably a temptation. You get a bonus. It's almost like this found money just to spend it, right? That can definitely happen for sure. It's not the case, though, that you should. Right. When talking about bonuses, I'm going to refer to this as chunky money. Sounds like a Ben and Jerry's flavor. I know. Different than the chunky monkey ice cream, but chunky money. And chunky money is the money that comes in sporadically, usually quarterly or annually. Every once in a while, I run into a client who gets this monthly. It doesn't have a defined amount. Mm -hmm. And usually we'll see it in the form of traditional bonuses from an employer, the sale of employer stock, whether it's an employee stock purchase plan, um, restricted stock units or stock options. And the rule of thumb that I'd say there is to plan to save 80% of that money and spend no more than 20%. This is almost like found money that's not in your budget. This is the best way to handle it. Absolutely. And earlier, I think I actually misspoke because I said ESPP money in there too. That can be chunky money, but it's not money that I would I would include in that rule of thumb. For employee stock purchase plan money, save 100% of it. It's just a way to raise your income. Mm-hmm. 
I think about not in the tech sector and having these types of benefits, but when I was a radio DJ, I had my base salary, and then I would get bonuses for appearance I did at like a used car sale on a Saturday or like an endorsement that I did on the air for a car that I was driving around or something like that. And that was not part of my salary, and that was found money to me, and this would have really applied there if I, that extra money that I wasn't planning on, in hindsight, I wish I had saved <laughs> 80% and spent only 20%. So your point is certainly well taken. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, if it's a hustle that you need to do to to make some money and make ends meet, that might not work so well. But if it's extra money outside of your budget, because really we should be living off of our salary Mm -hmm. with that 15, 20 and 65 percent, then saving 80 percent of this extra money, this chunky money is a is a very smart idea. Got it. Amy, I want to come back to your point about guilt related to spending, because this is fascinating to me. You would think that guilt around spending is a good thing because it keeps us from spending too much, right? Well, yes and no. I work with a business coach Mm -hmm. and my assignments on a weekly basis stress me out to no end. And my husband knows her, Mm -hmm. knows her fairly well and said, you know, you need to share that with her. And I was like, why? What's she going to do? This is going to make her happy that I'm stressed out about this (laughs) because I get my stuff done that I say I'm going to and... I ultimately shared it with her and she said, what am I supposed to do with this information? (laughs) I said, exactly. I don't know. But he said, you'd want to know. And she said, well, I'm actually kind of happy about this because it's pressure. It's accountability. Mm -hmm. Sure. Absolutely. I said, that's what I expected. So, yes, guilt, if it's the right thing, can be good. So when I was six years old, Cabbage Patch Kids were all the rage. I remember. You and I are pretty close in age. I remember (laughs) that. And I had wanted a Cabbage Patch Kid for I don't know how long. And I didn't know what was happening. But my mom said, hey, we're we're running to the local like drugstore. Mm -hmm. She's like, there's a surprise there for you. So my brother and I get in the car and I'm like, what is it? What is it? What is it? Well, it turns out that the store had gotten 100 Cabbage Patch Kids in, 100. And they were in like three parts of the store. And I don't know how many hours I spent having picked one out, walking to another section, trying to decide which one I wanted. Well, I got Wyman Gibb Mm -hmm. and I still have him. My daughter got to play with him when she was little. I took him home that night, played with him. The next day, I took him all over the neighborhood And right before dinner, I came out of my bedroom with him all packed up in his box Mm -hmm. and I was sobbing. And even now, like I have like tears in my eyes as I say this, because I remember the feeling and it was the first time I ever experienced this. And my mom looked at me and said, what are you doing? And I said, mom, it's time to take him back. Really? (laughs) And she was like, why? What's going on? Well, I paid for him myself at six years old at like $75. And I had been saving that money for who knows how long because I got maybe $2 a week in allowance. And so I was feeling this conflict over I have saved for this goal. Now I've reached it. Is it worthwhile? And I've played with him and that's great. But now I don't have a goal. And what else could I be doing instead with this money? All at six. Wow. This is explaining a lot as I get to know you a a little bit more and more each month, Amy. (laughs) Fair enough. So, you know, all of that said is there are times when we need to be careful um, and not spend too much. You know, when your discretionary income is low because your work hours have been reduced. Yeah. This is something we're seeing with physicians and nurses and our healthcare folks. I think with COVID, we tend to think they're all working all the time, but- you know, anesthesiologists and occupational therapists and such, their hours have been cut. Right, because the hospitals are spending so much resources on COVID that they're not able to do these elective surgeries, which is where all these hospitals make their money, and then there's layoffs and furloughs. And I hadn't realized that till recently, but that is scary true. Absolutely. So I think the question that we have to ask if we're using the word guilt, and I think there's lots of different words we could use there, especially if we looked at Brene Brown uh, and her work, but Are you feeling what you're feeling because it's a tight budget and it's the smart thing to do? Or is it, you know, the six-year-old me with a Cabbage Patch kid that has FOMO, fear of missing out? Or is it knowing that you aren't being intentional with your other spending 
And so spending on this bigger item that you would normally be able to afford and that is intentional doesn't feel good. Hmm. You know, that's something we sometimes see is people have a spending plan. I won't call it a budget so much, but they have a spending plan. And included in that is this travel experience for their family. And they just have a hard time pulling the plug on that. And sometimes it's it's because they know they weren't as good in other areas and weren't as intentional as they really wanted to be. And they want to be intentional. So the thing they end up wanting to give up is the thing that they really needed to be intentional about and chose to be intentional about in the beginning. But that goes back to something we've talked about in so many of our previous episodes, Amy, about the psychology of money and how in your role as an advisor, you also sometimes have to be a psychologist because you get into all this guilt and all these underlying causes of why people make the decisions and feel the way they feel about money. It really is psychology 101, maybe not 101, maybe like 301 at this point, (laughs) but definitely a big psychological piece of it. And there's a big piece of what we call behavioral coaching Mm -hmm. that happens. And yes, you have to get to what's driving someone to make the choices they're making. All right. Well, in terms of coaching behavior, as we wrap up here, what are some tricks you share with clients to reduce the spending? One of the big ones is stop you putting your expenses on a credit card. Hmm. Even if you get points and miles and all the, the various perks, Use cash wherever possible. Now that isn't always possible, but use cash. It's harder to hand over the cash than it is to hand over the credit card. So you're saying not even a debit card, you're saying actual cash. Cash, Mm mm-hmm. You have to keep track of it, like it's disappearing out of your wallet and you see that. And you know, a debit card is better than the credit card that has the perks on it. Mm. The debit card has a finite amount of money in that account. Actually, not so much, that is true, but The reason is that people justify the spending because of the perks. My wife taught me a long time ago that the minute you pay a dime in interest on that credit card, you more than overcompensate for those perks. Those perks are irrelevant once you start paying interest. She's like, if you're going to use your credit card, and I knew the look that she gave me, you better pay the full balance every month and not pay any interest because you're losing those benefits the minute you start paying interest. That's true. The other piece, though, is that you also, even if you can afford to do it, you will increase your spending because you get the perks. Like this fits Uh, in my budget. I wouldn't have gotten it otherwise. But guess what? This is going to help towards that trip to Hawaii because it's going to help my plane tickets. Makes sense. Okay, gotcha. Okay, so that's number one. The other is set a budget or spending plan, whichever word you really want to use for variable and regular expenses, such as groceries, dining out, entertainment. Mm -hmm. My husband and I do this. We have a budget for these things on a weekly basis. And so we have a separate account. We call it our weekly spending account that that money moves over to every Friday. Okay. And we do it on Friday because then we have the weekend, which is when we're most likely to spend money. Mm -hmm. And I also know that if we don't, get on grocery shopping then on the weekend that we're likely to blow that dining out and doing other fun things. Mm -hmm. And then come Monday or Tuesday when I'm like, Oh my gosh, we need groceries. (laughs) We've already spent that money. Got it. Okay. So it's a behavioral trick for us. Mm -hmm. And then look for easy changes. If you're an impulse grocery shopper, then take advantage of these expanded opportunities to buy your groceries online or to, Mm -hmm. you know, and have them delivered or be picked up. Yes, there's a cost for that, but it can keep you from having the impulse buys because to order there, you almost have to do your meal planning. Yeah, that's so true. I I went in pre-COVID, my wife would make fun of me. I'd walk down the aisle of the grocery store, oh, bag of chips, oh, cookies, oh, candy, or oh, that uh, $10 prepared meal looks good, but if you're ordering it online, it's a lot easier to stick within a budget and like you said, to a meal plan. That is absolutely huge. Yeah, we've definitely found, and this was pre-COVID, that clients who switch to ordering their groceries online and then driving through and picking them up, which is what one of the big grocery stores chains here has done for quite a while, mm-hmm. uh, found they were saving large amounts of money on their grocery spending. Us too. The other thing is who wants to watch the spending on every single item that they put into their grocery card online or (laughs) in the store? I don't know anybody that wants to do that. So the easier trick is to watch where you're shopping. Okay. For example, if you're going to to the store nicknamed Whole Paycheck. Yes. um, Or Blank Foods Empty Wallet. Yep. There you go. 
you're likely going to need to watch every item you buy. But if you switch to your local grocery store that has a good natural food section, Mm -hmm. because that's probably why you're shopping there and a good organic section, if that's what you're shopping for, then you won't have to watch as carefully because the prices will already be lower. Got it. Actually, I have a good story about this. Our last house, when we moved there, we noticed our grocery bill went up by about 250%. Yikes. It was just a couple months after we moved in. I said, what the heck happened here? Well, In our old neighborhood, we had a little meat market that we went to. We had a farm stand. And so I'd hit those two places first and then go to the grocery store Mm -hmm. for the staples. Well, at our new house, we had that same um, whole paycheck store a couple blocks from us that was walkable. We had uh, another store similar within a couple of blocks. And we didn't have our meat market. We didn't have our produce stand And so we were regularly not planning any longer and just walking three blocks down the street to go get our groceries Mm -hmm. on a daily basis and then impulse shopping. But we also found that our regular grocery store in our new neighborhood, which was the same as in our old store, charged up to 40% more for some products than it did at our old store. So I found, hey, if we're in our old neighborhood, we're over visiting friends, whatever, that's a great time to run to that grocery store instead. The variance in price between different stores is shocking sometimes. I do not pay attention to this, but my wife and I have the national chain grocery store that we go to here, and then we have the the large membership store where they have large quantities of items. And she Uh will tell me that, yes, it makes more sense to get this at the big store because that's a better price, and this we're going to use this large quantity of whatever is buying, but this is actually cheaper at the grocery store. This one's cheaper at the big box store. She tells me which store to get each item at, and I, I'm impressed because she tracks it so well, and there's <laughs> such a big difference. There can be, yes. So I think the other, the last trick that I'd share is make your spending intentional. Mm-hmm. I think this is so important. Our clients overwhelmingly work with us because they do want to be intentional about reaching their goals around retirement and kids' education, financial independence, whatever the goals are. And so thinking about that intentionality and making it part of your day-to-day choices will help make all of these other things easier. Got it. Amy Walls, Thibbleberry Financial, if people want to come talk to you about being intentional for their retirement and intentional about their spending and their budget and all these things we've talked about today, what are the best ways to find you? Online at thimbleberryfinancial.com or give us a call at 503-610-6510. A lot of great stuff today. Thanks as always, Amy. We'll talk soon. Thanks, Jag. Registered representative securities offered through Cambridge Investment Research, Inc., a broker dealer, member FINRA, SIPC. Investment advisor representative, Cambridge Investment Research Advisors, Inc., a registered investment advisor. Cambridge and Thimbleberry Financial are not affiliated.